Hey, how's it going? This is Chad Haig reporting from Southern India. I'd like to continue this series of videos on the philosophy of Ted Kaczynski in this fifth lecture within our ongoing paragraph-by-paragraph paragraph group reading of the so-called Unibaber Manifesto, Industrial Society and Its Future. We will move on to the section of the text spanning from paragraphs 181 to 212. This is the section of the text where Kaczynski really discusses both the strategy of a hypothetical revolution against the concept of modern technology and the ideology of Freedom Club, which really is just the ideology of nature itself. This is a part of the School of Forbidden Text. Remember, you can join us there too for the extremely low price of just $2 per month. Link to both my Patreon and subscribe to our accounts in the video description. Also, if you find this discussion interesting, you may want to check out my 2019 book, The Philosophy of Ted Kaczynski, my 2022 book, Leftoid Psychology, and the upcoming book, Accelerationism and DP. Ecology might sound like a contradiction in terms, but we'll find within this video that um, none other than Kaczynski himself might be um, associated with this strange combination of ideas. And we also must begin with the disclaimer that this video is for educational purposes alone. The purpose of this video is neither to promote nor to refute any theories, but rather to examine them from a strictly philosophical perspective. All right, so as we get into the content of the text itself, uh, the main thing which I find interesting in this part of the book, spanning from uh, paragraphs 180 to 212, is whether in this um, section of the text specifically, one might be able to find some evidence that Kaczynski actually espouses what I myself call the deep accelerationist stance. That is the paradoxical combination of a deep ecology and accelerationism. Now, your first reaction on hearing that very term will likely be the objection that such a stance is impossible to attribute, not just to Kaczynski, but to anybody, because these two terms would seem to be polar opposites of one another. After all, the accelerationists openly promote the acceleration not just of capital, as is usually thought, but of technology itself, while deep ecology tends to be associated in people's minds with the exact opposite movement, which is usually called the deceleration. So deep acceleration would seem to be the ultimate contradiction in terms. Well, I will argue over the course of this video and uh, on a much deeper level within my upcoming book bearing this title um, that this is not only a possible stance, but this is one which none other than Ted Kaczynski himself already provides arguably the single best instance of, and he does so within the Unabomber Manifesto itself. And so as we get into the paragraph-by-paragraph paragraph analysis of the text, we find in paragraph 180 that Kaczynski famously opens this part of the book with the quote that um, the technophiles are taking us all into an utterly reckless ride into the unknown. He goes on to note within this same paragraph that even among the small minority of people within the population who consciously realize how dangerous the trajectory of continued technological advancement will be, while most of those people still feel completely powerless to actually stop it. Freedom Club will differ, then, in that they will make up the hyper-minority of thinkers who not only realize what is going on, but also believe that it can be stopped. Over the course of the rest of this video, we will explore uh, Kaczynski's reasoning behind this uniquely bold claim, not only that a revolution against the concept of modern technology is hypothetically possible, but also his ideas over how it might actually unfold on a concrete level. But before we can get to that, there are a few very complicated ideas which must be unpacked even in this one short quote which has opened this section of the text. A perceptive reader might ask, for example, why exactly it is that Kaczynski is describing the trajectory of continued technological advancement as a quote-unquote reckless ride into the unknown. That would seem to contradict everything which Kaczynski and Ulul have already said about technology as basically being the antithesis of anything having to do with the unknown. After all, technology is really all about solving every mystery of nature. It's about um, generating technical procedures which are guaranteed in advance to yield whatever predetermined results one happened to desire. Well, technology's obsession with full epistemological transparency and the creation of fully predictable operations, this might seem to be the exact antithesis of anything having to do with the unknown, but the situation is a good deal more complex, pun intended, than that. 
Well, in order to make sense of this apparent contradiction, we must bear in mind that when Jacques Ellul and Ted Kaczynski talk about technology, oftentimes they actually are not speaking about the thing which you might think that they're talking about. As you may recall from our reading of Jacques Ellul's Technological Society, technique cannot be defined as being identical with any particular physical machines because technique had to pre-exist those machines as a fully abstract, systematic rationalization oriented towards maximizing things like, say, efficiency, adaptability, or productivity. It had to have that abstract character of a systematic rationalization before any one machine could come to instantiate that logic on a more material or concrete level. This is not, however, the maybe naive view that you have to have the theoretical knowledge about how to manufacture a given machine before that machine could come to obtain a physical existence existence as a real entity. It's rather the deeper point that the machine had to have a space opened up for it within a pseudo-ecological system of many other machines that had to be predetermined by technique itself on a purely abstract level before that particular machine's existence could be justified. As Elul noted in the second chapter of that same book, this is because there is no such thing as a machine in the singular. There is always instead a whole system of many interconnected machines working collectively towards the goal of maximizing the efficiency and predictability of the whole system. Likewise, the paradox of technology is that despite its obsession with materialism, it actually holds a purely abstract character. Crucially, we can now see that it is only in the purely hypothetical realm of such systematic rationalization that something like quote-unquote full predictability can seem to be a realistic goal. The problem for technique is that as it progressively comes to actualize itself into the realm of concrete reality, transforming those ideals into physical machines one body at a time, it has to actually accomplish that goal through continually transforming nature itself into more and more pieces of its own self-propagating system. This is a process which admittedly does succeed in the short term in converting much of nature into the kind of predictable extensions of techniques predetermined logic which it would require but in so doing technology still has to reach out into a realm where the problems of complexity theory throw a monkey wrench into its plans we know from the terminology of complexity theory that the kind of formally unpredictable side effects one gets through meddling with natural processes are called emergent properties emergent properties might be described in as new parts of a whole whose characteristics cannot be deduced in advance even from a bulletproof analysis of the characteristics of any of the pre-given parts of that same whole. An example of an emergent property within nature um, which lies very close to home uh, for us is just um, human consciousness itself. Human consciousness is formally unpredictable in its characteristics if you only limit yourself to the standpoint of the set of the material elements within the brain from which that human consciousness emerges as a secondary epiphenomenon. Well, we now understand the irony that the same technological system which requires a full predictability still inevitably ends up generating so many unpredictable side effects because it is specifically technology's interaction with nature which is both necessary for its advancement but also guaranteed to eventually cause the system of technology itself to cross a certain threshold where it will overstep its own hard ecological limits. At that point, the global technological system will collapse as a result of its own accidental ecological disruptions. It is in this precise sense that deep acceleration actually makes perfectly good sense as a credible position which somebody could espouse, for Freedom Club's insistence that it can be stopped really means that technology is already guaranteed in advance to eventually reach a point of ecological impossibility where its interaction with nature will create the mother of all unpredictable side effects. That's the deep ecology side of it. The accelerationist side is acknowledging that that point 
point will be reached not through thwarting technology from its current self-dooming trajectory, but precisely through following it through to its own logical conclusions. We must bear in mind that in the second chapter of Kaczynski's uh, 2016 fragmentary magnum obis, anti-tech revolution why and how, um, he revealed that the true solution to the mystery of Fermi's paradox, asking why it is that despite untold billions of years that have unfolded and countless inhabitable planets out there in the universe, um, no uh, evidence of intergalactic space travel has ever been found, despite the fact that on a purely logical level, you'd have to conclude that at least one alien civilization has been able to do it. Well, um, Kaczynski's solution to this paradox is that um, the kind of um, technological society which would have advanced to the point of being able to do intergalactic space travel would have already long since crossed the point of self-destruction. This is because self-destruction occupies a hardwired position on the timeline of technological advancement, which is necessarily much earlier than that of intergalactic space travel. In other words, self-destruction is a necessary rather than accidental outcome of all advanced technological societies. Likewise, we can now see that the deep accelerationist is somebody who understands that certain flashpoints must exist in which a phase transition into a singularity, which suspends the laws of technique itself, where that will occur, um, and then understands that intensifying those flashpoints will only speed up the inevitable arrival of a certain point where technology has to confront the limits of its own ecological impossibility. Well, we now see that all of this mysterious talk of the singularity as the point at which the laws of capital or technique come to be suspended, um, we now realize that that is something that will happen only because the laws of technique never had anything but a purely abstract and negative pseudo-existence. The singularity, which pulls back the curtain to reveal the purely abstract nature of technique, despite the fact that it was obsessed with materialism, well, um, that will really just be a revelation of the nothingness of technology and the liberation of nature to reclaim the fullness of being which it had always already had. We now see that the formerly unpredictable antithesis to technology really is just the kind of nature which Kaczynski has otherwise called freedom. In paragraph 181, Kaczynski explicitly repeats his suggestion from paragraph 166 that the way technology can be stopped is through intentionally adding stress to the system. But in this paragraph, he clarifies that the reason for this is that adding stress to the system will progressively make it more and more unstable until it eventually reaches a point of critical state instability in which a revolution against it might be possible. If you look at Jim Rickard's writings on financial collapse theory, um, he also uses complexity theory to argue that a given system has to reach critical state before a phase transition can occur. A great example of this is uh, the boiling of water. That water has to reach a certain temperature before the phase transition from liquid state to gaseous state can occur. It is in this precise sense that Rickards has repeatedly warned his viewers that a coming financial collapse is guaranteed, but not because Rickards himself claims to know in advance which particular event will push it over the edge. All of that's unnecessary because all one really needs to know is that the financial system is already dangerously close to reaching critical state due to factors like strong structurally unpayable debts, mass money printing, etc. Rickard's own favorite analogy to illustrate this is that if a snow in the mountains has already reached critical state in which an avalanche is guaranteed to occur, one would be missing the point entirely if one obsessed over asking which particular snowflake would be the one to cause it to tip over into avalanche state. Well, similarly, Kaczynski implies here that adding stress to a system which is already dangerously close to critical state as a result of its own ecological impossibility, that will help finally push the system over the point at which it becomes unstable enough 
that a real revolution could be possible. Kaczynski explicitly references the French and Russian revolutions as concrete examples of successful man-made revolutions in the past, uh, because in both cases, the revolutions only came to be executed after the political orders they were rebelling against had fallen into critical state. In the case of France, this was due to financial crisis, while military defeat was the cause in Russia. Paragraph 182, Kaczynski acknowledges that one might very well object at this point, but weren't the French and Revo uh, Russian revolutions failures? Well, that really depends on which goal of the revolutions you're examining. The revolutions had both a positive and a negative goal, and in the second positive goal of creating a new society that functions exactly as it had been envisioned to, well, that was indeed a failure, and um, thankfully so, as Kaczynski says himself. But the first purely negative goal goal of destroying the old form of society, that was actually a success. Similarly, Freedom Club has no illusions of even trying to create a new social order that will function exactly as predicted. In fact, Kaczynski would later go on to devote the whole first chapter of Anti-Tech Revolution Weinhau to the theme of why exactly it is uh, that it's impossible to steer a given society in any predetermined direction, no matter how powerful one might seem to be. This really is a explained in that same chapter as something which is impossible due to the same problems of complexity theory, such as feedback loops, adaptability, and immersion properties, which are tacitly uh, playing a major role in this part of the Unabomber Manifesto as well. Well, as he notes in this part of Industrial Society and its future, um, Freedom Club is perfectly content with the merely negative goal of dissolving the technological society. But he notes in the next paragraph, paragraph 183, that this is because Freedom Club's positive goal is just nature itself, but by nature he means something perhaps different from what you might expect. When he talks about nature, he's talking about really wild nature, which is a kind of nature which is allowed to spontaneously create itself without any interference. For this reason, Kaczynski subtly rejects any attempt to impose, say, a Pentelinkola-style eco-authoritarian state in which a green police force would be tasked with coercing people to have to live within strict ecological limits. For even this green police state would still be a form of technology in disguise. We must remember that because Jacques Ellul defined technology as the replacement of the laws of nature for the laws of technique, we now realize that the true deep accelerationist is just the one who suspends the latter entirely in order to allow the laws of nature to return to their former, completely unrestricted state. This makes more sense, perhaps, in light of Ted Kaczynski's unpublished 1971 essay, Progress versus Wilderness. In that classic text, Kaczynski favored the idiosyncratic term wildness over the more usual term wilderness in order to show that much of what we consider today to be wilderness no longer really is wild, and this is for the precise reason that it's no longer really free from the interference of the technological system. And consider the way that even if something like forest is allowed to continue existing within the United States, it's largely reduced the status of a recreational campground. This is a place where suburbanites can go away for the weekend to barbecue hot dogs and take photographs of themselves in front of some scenic lake before they go back to their corporate office jobs Monday morning. This sort of wilderness has therefore lost its natural freedom in much the same way that humans have under modern technology. But this sort of symmetrical relation between the two losses of natural freedom really does make sense in light of this paragraph of the man at in which Kaczynski explicitly includes human nature as a smaller part of wild nature, rather than think of it as something which is inherently predisposed to negate natural conditions in favor of technological ones. He does not take the Frankfurt School of Critical Theory approach, in other words, of saying that the only problem with technology is that it extends human nature's pathological will to domination um, much further than had been the case in pre-modern conditions. For human nature is exactly what technology has been hardwired to negate as it has progressed. 
For this reason, Kaczynski implies in paragraph 184 that the hypothetical return to really natural living conditions um, will ironically be the exact opposite of what anarcho-primitivists like, uh, say, John Zerzon envision as the green utopia. Kaczynski clarifies this surprising claim by noting that if nature and technology really are polar opposite terms from one another, then even the agenda to willfully engineer a John Zerzon-style anarcho-primitivist utopia well, that would still be a very strange technological project in disguise, for that would miss the real point of nature by simply turning it into a perverse technology which is guaranteed to function as intended as a means to an end to create the ideal living conditions for humans to escape from the miseries of civilization. You might bear in mind that John Zerzon is fond of reminding his readers that um, even the modern SJW causes of gender equality pacifism and animal rights were supposedly universal staples of the prehistoric hunter-gatherer past. So if you really want these values to go mainstream, you have to return to those conditions rather than continue progressing beyond them. However, this misses the point of nature by turning it into a means to an end to give humans the kind of society which they think they're entitled to. No doubt as a result of living under the same 21st century conditions which they claim to want to transcend. Now, Kaczynski clarifies in this paragraph that after the collapse of the technological system occurs, living close to nature won't have anything to do with a consumeristic choice. Living close to nature will be strictly necessary in such a context because in the absence of modern technology, one really doesn't have any choice except to live much closer to the natural world, even to do things like meet very basic survival needs. The vast majority of people in such a situation will have to farm, hunt, fish, or forage just to be able to eat. And this is not a historical anomaly, for for the vast majority of human existence that was the case. The grand irony here is that there will be no such thing as environmentalism under these natural conditions because the environmentalist is really just a person who thinks that he or she can make the consumerist choice to like nature in much the same way that one can choose to like a NFL football team over another, or a brand of beer, or a genre of popular music. One only really lives naturally if doing so is not a choice, for this idea of choice presupposes the existence of an advanced technological system, as well as so many marketing niches and an industrial production apparatus to satisfy those largely artificially created desires. In paragraph 185, a hypothetical voice speaks up and asks the legitimate question of whether such a real revolution will have some negative consequences. Well, the answer to that is, of course, yes, but it bears mentioning that negative consequences are inevitable even if technological advancement continues unimpeded. And the negative consequences of the latter are far worse even up to including things like human extinction. Paragraph 186, Kaczynski goes on to suggest, in light of this maybe difficult realization, that Freedom Club's ideology has to take on two different forms depending on its intended audience. There should be one form of the ideology for the unthinking majority, who can only process arguments in black and white terms and sweeping generalizations. But beyond that, there should be another version of the ideology which might be called its true form. This is the ideology as tailored to an audience capable of a much higher level of nuanced critical thinking. Paragraph 187, he notes that the ideology which is tailored for the minority of rational thinkers should be something like what Jacques Ellul did, which is a thoroughly philosophical exposition of what technology really is in contrast with what the general public mistakenly thinks technology is. However, this ideology should also be practically geared to using these serious thinkers as influencers, although by influencer we do not mean this in the sense of uh, some dumbass on TikTok who dances for 30 seconds for a mostly non-existent audience of bot accounts and thinks as a result of that that they're famous. Nor do we mean uh, influencers in the sense of the kind of paid trolls who are 
sent out by, uh, say, the pharmaceutical industry um, to flood the comments sections of any problematic blogs uh, with views that seem to be those of ordinary people, but just happen to directly coincide with the opinions of uh, Pfizer's corporate boardroom meetings. No, real influencers will use reason and logical argumentation to provide an ideological revolution against a technology which is every bit as important as any more concrete action. Paragraph 188, Kaczynski interestingly notes that rabble-rousing propaganda of a very base and vulgar type should generally be avoided. But he makes one exception to this rule by acknowledging that rabble-rousing propaganda actually will be quite useful to employ when the system finally reaches critical state. Isn't this just an admission that accelerating technology in the very precise sense of the technology of cheap, unthinking propaganda will be used as the final nail in the coffin to bring down the idea of modern technique itself? Well, the big idea of accelerationism, you might recall, is to keep pushing the same trends which the system had already created, and to do so with the realization that it is these same trends which will lead the system to overstep its own laws. What better example of this than the kind of cheap vulgar propaganda referenced here? You might recall Jacques Ellul noted in the Technological Society that you can only defeat one technology of propaganda with another. This was proven very recently by CNN's complete and utter defeat by Fox News, much of which was driven by the reptilian brain-based uh, success which Fox News had um, at being just plain better at featuring hot babes like Emily Campagno as their anchors, in contrast with CNN's inexplicable decision to keep fat asses like Brian Stelter, Jeffrey Tubin, and Brianna Kyler on the air until recently when they were removed. Well, in paragraph 189, Kaczynski warns that even when one reaches the moment of critical state, the movement will still be unlikely to have a majority of the population on their side, but this won't really matter because the quality of a small group of rational and committed people should easily outweigh the sheer quantity of a numerical majority of the population. Paragraph 190, Kaczynski warns that adding social stress is good, but not all social stress is created equal. For example, one should avoid pitting the revolutionaries against the American public itself. They should instead make the widely despised elites the common enemy of both. One should focus one's energy on the latter, despite the fact that it is technically true that both of these groups are uh, guilty of causing the crisis. It is factually true, for example, that Americans drive pollution and resource depletion through their overconsumption, but it's also factually true that the elites use marketing gimmicks to induce the public to do so. They convince people to spend money they don't have on stupid junk that they don't even want. If you follow the analysis of John Michael Greer, they do this through literally dabbling in black magic. Well, even though both of these diagnoses of the problem are true, it's better to emphasize the latter explanation because it adds stress against the elites rather than needlessly add stress against the populist mass. But wait a minute, isn't this exactly the point which CNN has missed? Isn't this one of the reasons why its audience continues to shrink down to microscopic levels of irrelevance? As CNN recently reported their worst ratings since the administration of George H.W. Bush in the early 1990s. Well, if you really think about it, CNN dug its own grave precisely through flaunting itself as the marketing niche which only wealthy liberal elites with perfectly politically correct views could identify with. Well, insofar as CNN directed all of its energy into courageously waging war against the ignorant masses of the American public, they found out the hard way that that was not a very smart strategy for a cable TV network to adopt, because there are simply not enough wealthy liberal elites within the country to keep a network that needs millions of viewers to uh, meet the uh, expectations of advertisers afloat. In paragraph 191, Kaczynski warns that the greatest danger in promoting conflicts against anyone except the elites is that this will inadvertently create rivalry, uh, rivalry between sub-niches of the population. 
in which one side will inevitably have to use more technology to gain the advantage over the other to win. Consider the rivalry between different nations, or the rivalry between different religious groups. The only way that one side can beat the other is through winning an arms race of technological advancement, which negates in advance any idea of a revolution against technology. The only acceptable terms should be to oppose a small class of powerful elites to the populist mass of the people. Though the real opposition, Kaczynski is clear here, um, is between technology and nature. Paragraph 192, we find that the main thing not to do is to fall for the system's neatest trick, or the idea that intersectional disenfranchisement alone will serve as the standard to determine which group is the worthiest of our attention. Kaczynski notes that we should um, avoid this despite the fact that it may be empirically true that one group actually is more disenfranchised than another. If you take Native Americans as an example, they actually are more economically disenfranchised, but the solution to that economic disadvantage will inevitably have to be more help from the technological system, which is exactly the reason why the system openly promotes playing the game of the system's neatest trick as really using all of these groups as a means to an end to just advance itself. Paragraph 193, Kaczynski reiterates his claim from the beginning of the manifesto that this is not a political revolution, but rather a revolution against technology. Few presidents demonstrate just how irrelevant the office of the president actually is, like the current puppet-in-chief whose cognitive decline is actually something which the system had a perverse incentive to prefer back in 2020, for this only shows that the president never was anything except a purely symbolic figurehead who provides a digestible human face over a set of impersonal economic and technological functions, although that face has become a lot less digestible as it has looked more and more like a corpse. In paragraph 194, Kaczynski warns that the revolutionaries should actually avoid, and um, he does use capital letters here, um, avoid assuming power too early. The grand irony is that the revolutionary movement would be destroyed precisely if the revolutionaries seized political power before critical state was reached in the system as a whole. If that were to happen, um, the result would be quite predictable. Uh, the movement would become just another green party, just another mainstream environmentalist group in which they'd raise taxes on the public in order to siphon off more money for uh, clean energy and electric car companies, and then they would use the donations from those same corporations to fund their re-election campaigns. In the third chapter of Anti-Tech Revolution Winehow, Kaczynski would go on to provide a much more detailed explanation for why exactly it is that the timing of assuming power is so sensitive by noting that the rationalized laws of possible and impossible objects shows that um, any political movement which hopes to have a successful revolution must obviously be powerful. And keep in mind that a successful revolution against the modern technological system would be the single most difficult thing to do in history. But on the other hand, any movement which becomes too powerful inevitably becomes corrupt. You could just consider the academic industry as a great example of how true this is. So time really is of the essence here. The movement has to reach its highest level of power, but only during that extremely brief window of time, just before it becomes too corrupt to actually do away with something like the technological system, which it will become parasitic on in order to maintain its power. But this same moment where it assumes power, but is not yet corrupt, that must also coincide with the window of time in which the system itself has reached the kind of critical state in which a revolution against it would be possible. Kaczynski's ongoing opposition to the emptiness of linguistification therefore makes the most sense in this context, for if the moment arrives in which all of those things happen to coincide, and the only thing you can do is send out a tweet, well, let's just say you're screwed. Kaczynski also notes that on a demographic level, the revolutionaries should be outsiders, because if they happen to be drawn from the class of elites, or even if they come from the conformist bourgeoisie of the upper middle class corporate professionals among the American suburbanite population, they'll probably just turn the movement into another parasite 
on the technological system like the academic industry and environmentalist political parties already are. They'll use the critique of technology to go through the motions of radical critique while sucking up the funds to prop up their own privileged lifestyles and to advance their own careers. The outsiders who come from that region called Chimeria in the uh, writings on Conan the Barbarian, well, those Chimerians will be the ones needed to actually push that system beyond the point where even being such controlled opposition would be possible. Paragraph 195, we find that the revolution has to be worldwide and should not be seen as a way to promote the interests of America, or any nation for that matter, over its rivals. You uh, find Kaczynski note here explicitly that nationalism is a great promoter of technology because the only way for America to uh, beat China, for example, is just to be better at industrial manufacturing or to have more geopolitical influence. It's obvious the only way that those two goals can be met. You find in paragraph 196 that Kaczynski shocks the reader by openly favoring NAFTA precisely for its accelerationist potential to add stresses to the system. He notes that globalist economic policies disadvantage workers in the short term, but they make the system itself more interconnected, which serves the unintended consequence of enabling one revolution in one part of the world to multiply itself many times over, effectively spreading to all of the other nations for free. In contrast, if each nation were too self-contained, one would have to have multiple revolutions over and over again against the technological system in each one. It is precisely the technological system's own hardwired tendency towards global scopes of operation, then, which should be accelerated in order to lead it to overstep its own ecologically impossible limitations in the long run. In addition, the workers' discontent from getting screwed by unfair globalist trade deals is something that can be used as an accelerationist flashpoint, rather than maintain the short-term stability of allowing more people to be gainfully employed enough that they remain content with a life of mindless consumption on the weekends while slaving away for the system Monday through Friday, in contrast, allowing the technological system's own self-created stresses to compound over one another is what the real revolutionary must favor. From paragraphs 197 to 199, we find that the greatest irony here is that the environmentalists claim that the problem with modern man is that he has too much power over nature. That misses the point that uh, prehistoric hunter-gatherers actually had far more power than we do. And they had that power because they could go through the power process to meet really serious needs. The only thing we can do with the power process is a kind of stupid surrogate activities like getting to choose which NFL team we'll cheer for, or trying to collect a bucket of likes for social media posts, which will inevitably be buried into invisibility by the algorithm just a few short hours later. What we should argue for, then, is precisely for man to get his power back. But this does not contradict the ideal of uphold nature, for in a very strange sense, we can only get our power back if nature also gets its power back from the global technological system. In paragraph 200, Kaczynski repeats once again that the movement can only have one goal because if another goal happens to be allowed onto that list, one will inevitably have to use a technology as a means to an end to advance that other goal. Consider the uniquely controversial 2020 book, A Transgender Industrial Complex, as a great example of this. If your goal is to attack gender binarism as oppressive and outdated, Begs the question how one can do that except through presupposing the help of modern technology to do things like, say, allow sex change operations which simply would not have been possible a century or two ago. This in turn presupposes a new growth industry in which a sophisticated medical industrial complex will have to ramp up its production to meet all of this new demand, and savvy investors can realize this to be the great opportunity to make money that it is insofar as anyone who buys stock in these companies can count on the media, the Democrat Party, or public school systems to artificially bid the monetary value of those stocks a little higher by obsessing over things like, say, having children as young as eight years old undergo surgeries, which just happen to line the pockets of those woke investors who were clever enough to buy in on the stocks early on. Well, similarly, if you define the problem as just the environmentalist cliche of 
global warming rather than technology in general. Well, solution to that will have to be to improve the technology of manufacturing electric, uh, electric cars or solar panels, which will in turn require a whole other industrial production apparatus, which uh, the same woke, savvy investors will realize they can make a return on through having, once again, the media, Democrat Party, and public school system promote these same things too. Paragraph 201, Kaczynski mentions what I call the Bernie Sanders fallacy in my 2019 videos, or the idea that modern technology might be bad, but it can be allowed only in those cases where it promotes social justice causes. Well, this is the ultimate false choice of trying to save the good parts of technology while only getting rid of the bad, because it misses the deeper point that the same terms of intersectional disenfranchisement, which allow you to judge which parts should be saved in order to promote promote the interests of certain groups who deserve it. Well, these terms of intersectional disenfranchisement were invented by the global technological system itself, but as nothing more than a means to an end to spare its own eco-crimes from criticism by distracting the public with so many arbitrary identity categories, which are all actually on their way out as the system programs all of us to become carbon copies of exactly the same robotic non-person. In paragraph 202, Kaczynski admits that one exception to this general aversion to modern technology is that you can use communications technologies if you do so to spread the ideology. In 2019, I personally interpreted this as saying that uh, publishing on Kindle or making videos on YouTube is fine, so long as one uses this to spread the word about texts like this one. Paragraph 203, Kaczynski reminds us of a situation in which an alcoholic is sitting with a bottle of wine in front of him and it's only so long before he begins to rationalize taking one more drink on uh, grounds that, after all, uh, science has proven that a little bit of wine is actually good for you. It's proven that many of the people who lived to be over 100 years old, well, they were red wine drinkers particularly. Well, it's just the same with the human race and technology. It's only so long before you find some rationalization to keep using it, so long as it is there sitting in front of you like the bottle of alcohol for the alcoholic. The only solution really is to not have it. Paragraph 204 to 5, he notes that uh, revolutionaries actually should have many children. Objecting to this on grounds that the earth is already grotesquely overpopulated misses the point that the added benefit of having more rational, committed opponents to the problem of modern technology will easily outweigh whatever modest burden these few extra mouths will impose on a world which is already crowded with so many billions of human bodies that trying to stop that by not having a few extra children would be an exercise in futility anyway. Paragraph 207, Kaczynski begins his uh, famous discussion of the two kinds of technology by um, entertaining a question from a hypothetical voice whether the historical record only contains instances of technological progress, never examples of technological regress. However, if you scratch the surface here, you'll find that this claim is historically simply false. In paragraph 208, Kaczynski clarifies that the real source of this error is the logical fallacy of equivocation, which treats technology as one thing in the singular, when in reality there is a distinction between small-scale and organization-dependent technologies in the plural. The former, that is to say small-scale technologies, they can survive even if society breaks down, but the latter, that is to say the organization-dependent technologies, they necessarily break down along with the complex society of which they were a Part. A great example from the non-modern era is uh, Roman pottery. At the height of the Roman Empire in the ancient world, there were pottery factories that were large enough and productive enough that um, archaeologists have evac uh, excavated uh, pottery from these factories as far away as Scandinavia. We also have reason to believe that these products were mass-produced on so large a scale and for so reasonable a price that they could be found even on the table of commoners at the height of the Roman Empire. But in stark contrast with this, an archaeological dig confirmed that just a few centuries later in the Dark Ages, even a king in early medieval England was caught eating from pottery, which would have seemed embarrassingly crude even for a peasant in former times. This proves that even so basic a thing as wheel-thrown pottery was lost as a technology after the civilizational technology of the Roman Empire had collapsed. 
In contrast, small-scale technologies can be maintained by individuals or small groups like guilds, even in such difficult times, because, as Kaczynski explains in paragraph 209, before the Industrial Revolution, almost all technologies were small-scale. The, Ro the Roman pottery factories were something of an exception in the ancient world, but it was only after the Industrial Revolution that almost all technologies became organization dependent. A great example of this contrast is uh, Kaczynski's own example that a local craftsperson, no matter how skilled he or she might be, simply cannot build a refrigerator all on his or her own. For the construction of that refrigerator requires a globe-spanning network of resource extraction, factories for parts, shipping, etc. If just one link within that massive chain of dependencies were to disappear, the fridge would be impossible. In paragraph 10, he notes, likewise, enthusiasm for progress is not the a priori feature of all human nature, which we might think it is, for the ideology of progress simply did not exist in its present form until the 17th century, and it continues to be propped up today largely as a redundancy of our realization that modern technology is a ubiquitous and dominant force in our lives. Paragraph 212, uh, 211, excuse me, we find the proof that modern technology is not an inevitable or a priori feature of human nature is that the historical record shows that there were four major civilizations in the me late medieval era, but only one of those, which was of course the European civilization, went the technological route, which led to the present state of things. This proves that such technologization is something of a historical and sociological anomaly, for to this day nobody really knows why the Europeans did what they did, while the other three great civilizations did not. The only thing which we can be certain of is that this sort of technologization required abnormal historical conditions to arise, so leaving it behind would actually be a return to the historical norm. Paragraph 212, it's acknowledged that just in case somebody objects that even if a successful revolution is carried out now, how can you guarantee that there won't be another industrial rev revolution 500 years from now? Well, in response to this question, Kaczynski notes that even if that were the case, we certainly don't have time to deal with that right now, because that'll be a problem for the far future. We have more than enough on our hands right now as it is.